this video we're going to look at simplifying radicals. The reason we're looking at simplifying radicals is because as mathematicians we want to get exact answers whenever possible. And exact answers does not mean decimals. Exact answers means that we prefer to get fractions and square roots over decimals. Because when we get something that's a fraction like one-third and we change it to a decimal which is 0.3 repeating, well, if we start working with this number again, if we use 0.3 repeating and we round it, say, to two decimal places and start working with it, we've rounded and we've created some error in our problem because we're not actually using the true value that we got, which was this fraction. The same is true with square roots. If I get something like the square root of 2, I can change that to a decimal and round. I think it's 1.4 something. But if I start using 1.4 instead of just keeping it as the square root of 2, I've rounded and so I've created in my problem some error. And sometimes that wouldn't matter. Like if you're just trying to measure for um, building some furniture or something like that and so maybe you use the Pythagorean theorem and end up with something that's a square root or something like that. It may not matter a lot if you just go ahead and change it to a decimal. In fact, at some point you will have to change it to a decimal to be able to measure it out. But if we start looking at building things like bridges and buildings where every single thing that we do to create error is going to amplify the, the possibility of that bridge or building collapsing, then that's a really big deal. So we just, as mathematicians who are doing calculations for other people, we want to hold off that moment where we round as long as possible. So just like we can simplify fractions by reducing them, there are ways that we can simplify radicals so that as we keep working with them, they'll be easier to work with. Because square root of 2 wouldn't be that hard to work with because 2 is a small number. But if we start talking about square root of 80, 80 doesn't have a square root. But if I start working with square root of 80 and I, every time I use it I have to add or multiply 80, it's going to be super tedious when there might be an easier way. So here's the properties that we can use to simplify radicals. If we have a square root and we can think of the number under that square root as being a product, we could actually separate those numbers out into two different square roots. So using this square root of 80 idea, that means that I could take square root of 80 and say that that's the same thing as square root of 8 times the square root of 10. Or I could say that that's the same thing as square root of 2 times the square root of 40. And we'll learn here in a second what kind of things we want to split square roots up into. Um, so that that'll be helpful. The same is true if we have a fraction under a radical that we are allowed to break that fraction up into a radical on top and radical on bottom. So that would be helpful if we had something like the square root of 25 over 4. 25 over 4 doesn't simplify inside but we could change it to square root of 25 over square root of 4 and both of those have square roots so we would end up actually simplifying and getting rid of the square root. The rules for whether or not a radical is in simplest form are listed here. So we want there to not be perfect square factors other than one under the radical. So we'll see what that looks like on our examples. We don't want there to be fractions under our radical. So we'll use the second property to help us with that. And we don't want radicals in the denominator. And so the second one will also help us there. Let's take a look at some examples. So here we have some numbers under square roots. For instance, we have square root of 50. Now, there is not a square root of 50. If I type this in the calculator, I get a decimal. But 50 is made up of numbers. And one of the ways that we can split up 50 gives us a perfect square. So what we want to do to simplify a radical is think, is there a perfect square, which perfect squares are numbers like 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, and so on, that you can square root and get an integer 
So we want to think, is there any perfect square factor for 50? And there is. We can say that square root of 50 is really square root of 25 times the square root of 2. And if we split it up in that way, which we're allowed to do because of those properties, then we can say, well, I know what the square root of 25 is. It's 5. But square root of 2, I can't square root, so it's going to stay square root of 2. And that means that the simplified version of square root of 50 is 5 square roots of 2. So that's not too bad. We just have to be able to find a perfect square factor inside of whatever our number is. Sometimes that's easier said than done. If we look at C, 5400, that's a really big number. And it might take us a while to figure out what exactly we should be looking for here. So if you've already come up with what you think the answer is, that's great. But I'm going to suggest one way that we can um, do this is that we can actually make a factor tree, which you should have learned how to do in pre-algebra or an earlier math class, where we say, what's anything that 5400 can split up into? It doesn't have to be the right thing, but just is there anything I can think of that it would go into? And so I might say, oh, well, I know 10 goes in because it ends in 0. And I'd divide by 10 and say, oh, 10 and 540 multiply together. Neither of those are perfect squares, so I would keep going and just continue my factor tree. 54, I mean, 540 can also be divided by 10. And we'd keep splitting up. 5 and 4 goes to 6 and 9. And 9 goes to 3 and 3. And what we're looking for here is the fact that we've got um, these prime numbers. We've got three twos. We've got three threes. And we've got two fives. Not 55, two fives. So the idea here is if we completely factor this out, that what we're looking for is pairs of numbers because 2 times 2 is the square root of 4 but 2, the other 2 doesn't have a pair to work with. These two 3's can pair up and be square root of 9 and then we'd have a square root of 3 left over and the two 5's can pair up as the square root of 25. So there are three things here that I can take the square root of because I had pairs so that's 2, 3, and 5 and there's two things that I can't square root, which is the 2 that's left over and the 3 that's left over. So outside of my radical, I should get 2 times 3 times 5, which is 30. And inside my radical, I should get 6. Now that might be a little bit confusing, but basically if we make a factor tree, every time we have a pair of numbers, that is a, that's going to give us a number that would go outside. So a pair of twos causes this two to be outside. A pair of threes causes this three to be outside. This pair of fives causes this five. And the two and the three left over go back on the inside and get put together. Now, you may have looked at this and said, oh, let's divide by 100. So let's see how that works. We could have said square root of 54 times square root of 100. 100 does have a square root. It's 10. If you do it this way, that's fine. We would just have to say, okay, now let's check about 54, because 54 can go to 9 and 6, and 9 is a perfect square. So we'd have to do it again, basically. So it doesn't matter if you pick the right thing the first time, as long as you're able to start the problem in some way. But it is nice when the numbers are smaller, like on B, square root of 40. So we would either make a factor tree and look for pairs, or we could say, okay, four is a perfect square. Let's, let's split this into four and 10. And if we're not sure what perfect square goes into it, that's where if we have these perfect square, squares memorized, we can really pretty quickly say, okay, does four divide into it? Does nine divide into it? Uh, if 4 didn't divide into it, 16 is not going to. Does 25 divide into it? And so on um, to help us out. Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of 10 does not simplify because it's 2 times 5. So there's no perfect squares there.
So our answer is 2 square roots of 10. On D, we have 2 square roots, and we're multiplying them together. The rule is, um, from the previous slide, it went the other way. It said that you can take a square root and split it up into multiplication, but the same is true the opposite way. I can actually say, well, this is really like the square root of 60 because 5 times 12 is 60. You're only allowed to multiply things inside the radical together or things outside the radical together. So if there were numbers in front here of these radicals, they could multiply together and be in front, but I wouldn't be able to multiply the numbers outside with, these, with this 5 and this 12. But there's not numbers in front. Once I get square root of 60, then I try to figure out what it splits up into. Um, it is divisible by 4, so square root of 4, and square root of 15, so this is 2 square roots of 15. The other way you could do it is you could actually say, well, square root of 12 simplifies, and you could split up square root of 12 into 4 and 3, which means you have 2 square roots of 3. If you choose that route, then you'd say, well, there's a 1 in front of the first one, a 2 in front of the second one. So in front, I would have just 1 times 2, which is 2. And inside, I would do 5 times 3, which is 15. If you simplify first and then multiply, the danger is that you can really easily get a number right here that has to be simplified again. It's not a bad thing. You just have to make sure that you're checking your answer for more simplification. If we multiply first, like I did the first way, and then simplify, we'll only have to simplify once. Let's look at some fractions. So what we want to use is that property that says that I can split this up into a square root on top and a square root of bottom, and I can see if that helps. And before we ever choose to do that, it is helpful for us to look at the fraction and say, can I simplify this? like a normal fraction. 11 over 25 does not simplify. So we split up the square root and we say, well, I don't have a square root for 11, it's a prime number, but I do have a square root of 25, it's five, and that's all I can do to simplify that. So that's my answer. On part B, one of the things with this is our order of operations, where radicals fit in to PEMDAS, I didn't mean to underline the E, I just got carried away. Radicals fit into parentheses, that if there's something underneath our radical, um, those things are being grouped together like parentheses. So what we should do here is we, sh we should say, can I actually figure out what 112 divided by 4 is? And if I can, that's going to make things easier. We don't have to do it that way. We could split this up and simplify the top and the bottom, but it'll actually get us, it'll take longer to do that because off the top of my head, I don't know what square root of 112 simplifies to be, but if I divide this by 4, then it goes in 28 times, so I can say that this is really 6 square roots of 28, and square, square root of 28 is something that I do know how to simplify pretty quickly because it splits up into 4 and 7. So I take the square root of 4 and get 2. I leave the square root of 7, and I don't forget that there was a 6 in front the whole time. So 6 times 2 gives us 12, and the square root of 7 stays the square root of 7. We could have come up with the same answer if we simplified square root of 112 and simplified square root of 4 and then simplified our fraction that we got after that. Um, it just is easier if we divide first. Finally, we've got a couple more to look at. So this time on A, they already have it separated, which is fine. Um, it, we could still look at this and say, well, do 34 and 9 simplify? And they don't. So we would just say, OK, well, which of these can I actually figure out? Which I can figure out square root of 9. So this is square root of 34 over 3. And 34 isn't a prime number, it's even, but if I factor tree it to try to figure out what perfect square there might be, 
I say, okay, I know it divides by 2. Oh, 17, that's a prime number. So there's no pairs and it won't simplify. Whenever I have something on like on B, where I have radicals, but I also have numbers in front, um, this is saying to multiply this radical with the number in front with this radical and number in front. This is not saying to subtract 2. This is saying I'm multiplying by negative 2 square roots of 45. So the first thing I'm going to do is multiply my outside numbers together. So I'll put that over 1 to help. And that gives me negative 2 thirds. And then I can either multiply these together first and then simplify, or I can simplify and then multiply them together. So again, my preference most of the time is to go ahead and multiply first, although this does give us a big number. But if that is not your preference, that's fine. We get square root of 540, which is similar to something we had earlier. We know 9 goes into it. Um, it would go into it 60 times. So that gives us 3 square roots of 60. But 60 we also had earlier. That was uh, 4 and 15. And so we would end up with negative 2 times 3. Square root of 4 is 2 on the square root of 15. So the numbers, sorry, I forgot the bottom of that fraction. These numbers outside need to be multiplied together. These 3's cancel. So we get negative 4 square roots of 15. And that is our answer. So we just need to remember that with square roots, when we get a square root answer from here on out, we don't want to reach for a calculator and get a decimal. We want to leave it with a square root, but we want to check to see is there a perfect square that I can uh, factor out of this. And if there is, then we can simplify it in the way that we've just learned. So that is simplifying radicals.